Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Hello and welcome to The Money Factor. Today we're going to be talking about consumer affairs and our guest is Tom Fitzpatrick from the Albany County Department of Consumer Affairs. There's a lot going on in this area now as, as there has been for a long time and I think we'll have plenty to talk about, Tom. I don't think we'll be at a loss for words, Richard. <laughs> you were one of the first guests on our show and I know you probably told people a little bit about what, what your department does, mm -hmm. but if a lot of people's memories is like mine, uh, let's go over it again. What, what, what do you do? Sure. Uh, the Albany County Department of Consumer Affairs, uh, which also encompasses the Division of Weights and Measures, um, is responsible for um, checking uh, to see basically that the consumer is getting what they pay for. Um, we entertain consumer complaints on a variety of issues. Uh, we offer consumer uh, education programs. Uh, to any civic, organized civic group who, uh, who would like it. Uh, the programs typically last uh, an hour. Um, they're PowerPoint enhanced, and we have a pretty good success with them, and I think most of the, the folks enjoy it. Um, but by and large, uh, a lot of what we do involves uh, weights and measures. So uh, we check, uh, for example, all the gasoline pumps uh, in the county of Albany, all scales that are used for retail trade in the city or rather in the county of Albany, um, fuel oil trucks, um, things of that nature. We also check um, what's called commodities, and commodities are packaged products. Uh, so if you've ever uh, bought that box of cereal, which comes to mind with a lot of folks, and you open it up a lot and, of air inside. and say there's a lot of air in there and this doesn't look, it looks like it's only half full, well, our department goes out there and we check these things randomly uh, to ensure that the consumer is, in fact, getting the stated uh, weight product that uh, is supposed to be contained. I suppose sometimes if you have a larger package, it might look to people like they're getting more, and they might not look at the weight. So you may find, as I would just guess, that a lot of times it's actually what they say is supposed to be in it, but they've added air. Uh, yeah, usually, um, usually they're pretty good. Uh, we do find violations. Uh, they're finable violations uh, to the manufacturer. Um, and take a, a typical sized uh, supermarket, probably has about 35,000 items. Uh, offered for sale. Um, so we do them randomly. We'll check uh, package products um, to ensure that they are the correct weight. We find them both ways. We find them sometimes that they're short weight and we also find sometimes they're overweight. Huh. So that would just be the manufacturing process. Exactly. That's exactly what it comes down to. Yep. Now you said a couple things already that people might have uh, picked up on and said, oh, I didn't know that and I'd like to talk to this person. Uh, maybe they're a civic group, a Rotary Club, Kiwanis, whatever. That's right. And they'd like you to, let's go ahead and put your contact information up right away. We'll do it again at the end. Okay. Uh, but uh, how, do, how do people reach you? Uh, they can reach us uh, either on the county website, on the Consumer Affairs uh, page, or they can call us at 447-7581 and make a request. And like I said, if it's, uh, if it's an organized group and they would like me to come up and uh, do the program, I'll be more than happy to do that. Super. Yeah. Now, you, you mentioned weights and measures. So before we leave that and the, perhaps the service station, which is now a filling station more than, uh, or, or it's a grocery store, That's filling right. station, uh, there have been things in the news that people have said, my tank never held that much, or my, my tank holds more than that, or they don't think they're getting what they, they're paying for. That's right. Um, one of the most common complaints we get uh, from consumers uh, with the gas uh, issue is that uh, they'll read their owner's manual and the manual may state that the vehicle has a, let's say, 14 gallon uh, capacity fuel tank. And they'll fill the car up and the car will take 15 gallons. So they conclude that the pump is off one gallon at 15 gallons. And it sounds logical. It sounds logical and because they're looking at their owner's manual. Um, but there's a few things to take into consideration. We have found that uh, the owner's manual uh, for every vehicle is not always correct as far as what they are stating is the capacity of the tank. In other words, if it's a, a Ford certain model, if it's an XL model or something of like that, the tank may be a little bit different than it is on another Ford of the same model. Um, also, what the manufacturer considers to be full may not be what you can get in the tank. 
and uh, by and large, whatever the owner's manual states is the capacity of the tank, you can get more gas uh -huh. in that tank than is stated. Uh, you know, they're counting for expansion of the gasoline. Um, they're not counting the fill pipe, uh, which comes from the tank, they're where the nozzle for the gasoline goes in. Uh, so there could be any number of factors uh, that could impact upon that. Um, for us to see a gasoline pump that is off by one gallon at 15 gallons uh, is virtually unheard of. Uh, in, in the almost eight years that I've been in this business, I've never seen a discrepancy that large before. And of course, they're, they're saying, right, that would be a lot to be off on the pump. Yes, that they would be. They don't need that much. That would be an extreme amount to be off. And, and then they would think that they would be caught, probably, if you, they put it off that much. So if they're going to oh. be off, it'd be better to be off maybe 3%. Well, that's right. And um, when we do uh, uh, an analysis, when we do an accuracy check, uh, we take five gallons of gas from that pump. And five gallons of gas uh, is the equivalent of 640 ounces. Um, the tolerance level is, uh, that's allowed is six cubic inches. And six cubic inches translates to 10.8 ounces. So legally, at five gallons, a pump can be off by 10.8 ounces, Okay. no more. If it's off more than that, then it's a failure. We take the pump out of service and, and close it down until it is repaired. Uh, we find an equal amount of pumps that are dispensing more gas uh, to the benefit of the consumer, huh. um, just as we find uh, decreases, too, in the amount. Um, usually, they're pretty true. Usually, they'll come up at zero. Uh, they might be plus one or minus one. They're, they're very accurate, by and large. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if you found one off, you said uh, 10 ounces. How, what percent would that be? Much less than 1%, because you said 650 ounces. Yeah, 640 ounces uh, is, is taken. And if it uh, registers, if it's 10.8, more than 10.8 ounces, which is six cubic inches, um, then that would be a failure. And okay. we would shut the pump so it's down. It's like a sixth of a of a percent. That's, that's about right. right. Yep, that's not very much. No, it is not very much, no. Okay. So as, as I say, for a pump to be off, you know, uh, a gallon at 15 gallons would be a, a lot. Okay. It would need a lot. So uh, you get a lot of calls about this, about for, related to gasoline? Yes, we get a, uh, that's, that's a very common complaint, the one I just described. Uh, we also get complaints of, of a phenomena that's called pump jump. And uh, if you've ever, ever experienced this, sometimes uh, you'll turn the pump on, and before you even hit the trigger of, on the nozzle, you'll see it, it'll register four or five I've cents. Seen yeah. yeah, and that's called a pump jump. And usually that's uh, showing a, a leak in the line. And so the pump may be me measuring air at that point rather than fuel. Uh, seldom do you see a pump jump that is more than that. And should it occur, you should just stop and go inside and tell the attendant, and, and they will give you the, either the five or six cents back, or they'll reset the pump uh, for you to start over again. Pump jumps don't usually occur uh, over and over again at the same pump, uh -huh. okay? Um, so if it hadn't been used maybe for a while? It's exactly what happens uh -huh. uh, with premium fuel these days. Uh, you know, not too many cars run on premium fuel. Uh, people who used to use it don't because of the, the cost is prohibitive. Uh, so if the pump isn't used for a long period of time, uh, the prime on the pump gets kind of dry, and that would account for that as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, your office does some very specific things uh, that they're charged with, but, but you also help people. Uh, you do classes, and, and you, you take phone calls uh, if somebody has a consumer problem. That's right. What other kind of calls do you get? I'll get calls about uh, home improvement contractors. Let's go into that a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, we try to tell people to, uh, you know, before they have to call our office to do their homework, uh, to know the exact work that they want done on their home. Um, never agree to have work done on the spot. Uh, you know, a common scam is someone will uh, ring the doorbell and say, you know, I noticed that your uh, driveway, let's say, needs to be sealed. I have some extra materials from a prior job. Um, you know, I'd be happy to do it for a reduced rate. And either they don't do a good job or the materials that they're using uh, will wash away after the first couple of rainstorms. Uh, or someone may stop and say, I noticed that your chimney needs to be pointed up. Um, you know, I'll do that for $100. And they'll climb up on the roof and tinker around for a few minutes, come down, get the $100, and really not perform any work at all. So never agree to have it, uh, have it done on the spot. Always get estimates. 
uh, and that should include specific information about the materials and the services to be provided. And I always tell them to get a written contract. And we do have guidelines of uh, uh, things that should be included in each and every contract. Um, How can someone get those guidelines? They can call our office and we'll be happy to, uh, to give them that information. Um, the, you know, it's very simple. Uh, you know, you, you want a, a detailed contract, a contractor's name, uh, a permanent phone number, uh, a tentative start date, a tentative completion date, okay. a list of the materials specifically that are going to be used and the cost of the materials, and then stick to the contract. Stick to the contract. Often with home, home, improvement, uh, home improvements, um, folks will start it and because it looks so nice, they'll say, well, maybe I'm going to have this done as well. And, and they go on, and they're going outside of the contract. And this sort of uh, leaves uh, an open end for the contractor to, uh, to bolster the cost a little bit of that because it's not contained in the contract. It's an extra. And, you know, I don't want to uh, cast any dispersions on the, the home improvement uh, industry. Uh, by and large, uh, most of your contractors are reputable, and they do a good job. Um, but there are lots of them out there, and not all of them are reputable. And, and I've, we've had that, that experience, my wife and I. You have something done, and you say, oh, well, you come, up, you come up against a question. Oh, now, should we do this or this? And that's not in the contract. And now if you make a decision that's going to cost this person more, you really ought to know what that's going to cost. Because, right. for example, you do these little... Uh, tiles, these little, I forgot what they're called, but they're just little pieces of tile. They can cost eight bucks a piece. Yeah. So adding a few of those at the top could cost you several hundred dollars more. That's right. Yeah. So again, go back, have a new contract written up for that. Pencils, or, they're called. <laughs> oh, all right. And, and, and have some, or an appendage to the contract, you know, but again, in writing, specific about what it's going to cost, uh, you know, the estimate of what it's going to cost and so forth. Then at least you have uh, something to go back to should the contractor turn around and say, now you owe us, you know, X amount of dollars, and you you know realize that it's a, it's above and beyond what you had anticipated it would cost. Um, always check the work to make sure it is done uh, to the specifications that you want. Um, New York State uh, has a relatively new law uh, that you're not required to pay a home improvement contractor for 10 days uh, after uh -huh. the completion of the work, so that you can uh, have an opportunity to inspect it. Or let's say it's a roofing job. Uh, perhaps in the 10-day period there, you're going to have a, a downpour, and you're going to see if the roof leaks or not. Or get your hose. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah, or get your hose, and you could do it that way. Um, but the, the bottom line is uh, usually once, once you pay the money, trying to recoup the money is far more difficult than, than watching where you spend it to begin with. And even if you're successful, you may spend some money trying to do that if you, or, or perhaps small claims court's not that expensive, but you, there's time and what you're saying is really it may be difficult to, to get your money back. It is difficult. And, and while small claims court uh, is certainly uh, an option, um, it's not a panacea. Um, a lot of folks think that if they go to small claims court and they are uh, given an award, um, that the court collects the money for them, and they, the court does not. Uh, all the court does is make the award. Um, if the person who uh, has to pay doesn't pay, then it's incumbent upon the plaintiff to uh, continue with legal action to collect it, which isn't so easy. Right. Yeah. I know that if that happens from, from the library business, uh, there is some kind of a, an action taken at the county level so that if, if the person tries to do a transaction later, they may be stopped and, and one would get their money that way. But that could take years. That could take years, exactly. You, you could put a freeze on their bank account if you know what it is. Um, and so forth, but uh, you know, again, it's it's difficult in certain situations. You know, if it's, if it's a business that's uh, you know founded uh, you know in stone, that it's someplace that you can find that you can go to, uh, then enforcement officers can go there and they can actually take the money out of the cash register uh, to satisfy the award. But uh, in the case of of contractors and so forth, that that isn't always the case. So now, I think the the amount for the small claims court. Uh, Used to be two thousand, but now it's up to five thousand. Five thousand. That's okay. right. Yep. So anything up to that, and it's it's about damages, or what is it about? Is it? I mean, you can't just not like somebody, or uh, could you su could you go after your dentist? Yeah, you could go after your dentist, um, but 
Uh, what it does not include is you're not going to get an award for, let's say, mental anguish okay. or pain and suffering. Um, those are things uh, for... So services uh, and uh, something, something that's concrete. That's right. Okay. That's right. That you, that, you, that you have been deceived or the work has not been done or the work was shoddy, defective, and so forth. For those things, that you go after a recovery of the amount that you lost. Right. Okay. Yeah. And I do know also, I, I guess it's worth mentioning, that they have to be in the jurisdiction. It has to be filed in the jurisdiction where the person lives. So, That's right. Uh, I noticed on your website some things have to be in Albany County before uh, it's something that you can handle. That's true, yeah, and I should have qualified that, I suppose, but our, our offices, the services from our offices are available only to Albany County residents. Um, if they're, and, and if they call the office, it's on our uh, answering machine that uh, if they are not an Albany County resident, that they have to uh, seek out the Consumer Affairs uh, Department in their county if they have one. Or, or if not, then they can uh, direct it to the attorney generals of the state of New York. Now, what if a contractor is outside of Albany County? Would that, would you still be able to help? If the resident, if the complainant is from Albany County, yes, we, okay. would, try, we would try to help uh -huh. in, in, okay. that, in that case, yeah. Uh, sometimes I will make exceptions, uh, you know, if people, uh, you know, are, are doing business in Albany County and, and so forth, but they live just, uh, say, in Rensselaer or something, uh, you know, and they have a, it's related to the business, that, that's fine. Uh, we'll, we'll try to help with the complaint. Uh, but I get calls from people in Florida. Uh, I get calls from people in New York City all the time um, about a post office box business in, in Albany. And, uh, you know, we just okay. we don't Can't have help the power them. to do that. Yeah. Right, you know. right. Um, one, more, one more thing going back to the home contractors. You mentioned a contract. Now, what, what is a contract? Well, the contract should, as I said, contain the contractor's name address a permanent phone number. It should contain an approximate start and completion date, I said, specific description of the work to be done, specific description including brand names of the materials to be used, a payment schedule, uh -huh. all right, and this is important because a lot of times uh, contractors will ask for a third of the amount up front, and I caution people about this. Um, I don't see that any reputable contractor should require um, a person to pay a third up front so that they could buy materials to begin a job. I, I, I don't like it when I hear that. Um, there, there have been just too many cases of people getting the third up front and, and either they, uh, they never show up again, they just take the money and run, or they'll drop off part of the materials and then never come back again. And then you're trying to recoup that several thousand dollars or whatever it may be. Uh, so rather, um, I usually tell people that work it out a payment schedule uh, that when the work is is a third of the way through, perhaps you pay a third of the money, Maybe another third. Would, what what might be okay up front? Would ten percent be okay, or or do you think nothing? I think nothing. Uh, okay. that, that's my personal opinion on. I think nothing. Uh, I've I've had too many folks call me and and say, you know, I gave somebody twelve hundred dollars to start the job, and they haven't shown up yet. And I'll contact the contractor uh, if I'm lucky, and uh, they'll tell me, yeah, gee, I'm backlogged this, that, and the other thing, whatever it is, their excuses, and, and I'm going to get there when I can. Well, that's not satisfactory. Right. You know, you, you have paid $1,200, you expected work to begin on a, on a particular date, and it has not, and the contractor has your $1,200. To me, that's unacceptable. So I don't see any reason why work cannot begin. A reputable contractor has money to buy materials and so forth. The contractor can always put a lien on your property if you don't pay them. Uh -huh. All right, they know where you are, all right, but you don't always know where they are. And, and going into that, uh, I, I assume that, for one thing, they would have to sign this for it to be a contract. Absolutely, it can't just have the name of, of the company. And now, should should there be a company name, or what if it just says John Smith at the top? If if it's John Smith Contracting, fine. But as you said, there there should be a signature of the contractor on the bottom of that contract. Okay. Okay. And if there's a change, should there be a change to the contract or a, an additional piece of paper? Yeah, there can be an, uh, like an appendum um, that's, that's uh, followed up on with the contract, you know, uh -huh. uh, say, you know, Richard Daler, you know, requests that this be done and, and set up a separate uh, contract okay. with an appendum to it and have them sign that as well. Okay. Yep. Yep. We talked about small claims as a remedy. Uh, I know you, and maybe we should go back to this. There's after and before. So before we look at some other places to go, uh, you've stressed to me before the show started how important it is 
to avoid these kind of problems. Yes. And I guess you can't really stress that too much. I can't. The old adage, let the buyer beware, is just as true today as it was 200 years ago. And um, there's always going to be somebody out there trying to take advantage of the consumer, and it's incumbent on the consumer to protect themselves. And so there's so many avenues today, besides knocking on the door, which may be the classic. Uh, there's the internet, telephones. Sure, sure. Um, as I know, you're going to put up the number for the Do Not Call registry. Right. And if anyone um, hasn't taken advantage of that, I suggest that they do. Um, a benefit to the Do Not Call registry is that should a telemarketer call you and you're on the registry, should give you an indication that they're probably bogus uh -huh. uh, because they have no business calling you to begin with. And the, the industry pretty much adheres to that. Uh, since I uh, have gone on it, uh, the only calls I get from what we might say ostensible uh, um, telemarketers are ones that you have done business with in the past. Right. So if you've done business with a, a national company in the past, they can still call you about offers that, that they are providing. Um, but anyone else uh, cannot. Now you pointed out another number, and uh, while I use the Do Not Call registry, and it's wonderful, so that I now really wonder about anybody that calls me uh, outside of that. You mentioned another number uh, about uh, credit cards. That's right. Uh, there's also a registry for uh, Do Not Send Credit Card Applications. Uh, I know everyone is, is deluged with pre-approved, uh, pre-qualified, 0% uh, introductory, this, that, and the other thing, all types of uh, credit card offers. And, you know, d the fact that just that they're cumbersome to deal with is, is one thing. Um, but the fact also is that it has your information on it, and now you have to destroy it. Um, sometimes they'll send you an actual card, and people feel a little, you know, funny about just throwing that in the trash. So it's better not to have them come to your house at all. Especially and the numbers can, we see. Yeah, the numbers of them that you see. And you can call this number, and uh, it's a short questionnaire that, that, you can, uh, that you can answer right over the telephone. And they do ask you some, uh, some personal information, um, but it is a, it's a safe site. And um, once you've done that, uh, it takes about six weeks for it to become effective, and you'll no longer receive any more credit card applications. Fantastic. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, I've saved so much money by not taking up people's offers to save money that I, <laughs> I should be able to buy something. There you <laughs> well put. <laughs> Um, another place uh, to go back to uh, other, other types of redress uh, is the Better Business Bureau. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, what, what could you tell us about them? Um, well, first of all, they're a very good resource to check on a company. Um, again, it's not a panacea. Uh, the Better Business Bureau has registered members um, that if uh, the, the, the Bureau receives complaints and they're not resolved or they feel that the company didn't act in, in good faith, in attempting to resolve them, uh, their membership will be dissolved uh, with the Better Business Bureau. But also it's a useful tool uh, for consumers to go on if they're thinking of using a particular business and if the business is on the website, the Better Business website, they will provide you with information about complaints that they have received, um, the number of complaints, the types of complaints, the percentage of them that were resolved, unresolved, if, the, if they felt that the company uh, acted in good faith in trying to resolve the complaints and so forth. So it could be a useful tool. Um, just because a company is not in the Better Business Bureau doesn't make it a disreputable company. Or conversely, if one is in the Better Business Bureau, it's not stating that it is a reputable company all the time. But typically, anyone who is going to join the Better Business Bureau is, is more than likely going to be a reputable business. Right. And another resource uh, along those lines, just as an aside, um, is using the yellow pages. If a company is going to spend the money on advertising uh -huh. in the yellow pages, you know, it's a fairly good indicator that the company, uh, you know, is a reputable company. Um, another thing folks can do if, uh, say for example, uh, this time of year a lot of people are having roofs replaced, and you're thinking of having a roof uh, replacement, and as you're driving through your neighborhood, you happen to see a roofing company at one of your neighbor's houses. Well, if you wait until the job is complete and knock on your neighbor's door, just ask them if they were satisfied with the company. Well, certainly they're, they're going to tell you. Most people would be more than happy to tell you whether they were or not uh, satisfied with that particular company. And that sounds like it has an additional advantage uh, over asking the company for 
references. That's right. They always say, you know, a rule of thumb is ask the company for references. And uh, uh, my feeling on that is, well, that, that's okay, but the company isn't going to give you the names of people that they had problems with. Right. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. And they, they could easily have three good customers. That's right. They could. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay. So let's, let's talk about credit cards a little bit more. Uh, people get them. What happens, uh, do you get complaints about people saying, I didn't buy this gas, or uh, how did this get on my credit card? What, what do they do, uh, not, not necessarily to call you, but uh, how can they protect themselves against uh, some of these frauds or accidents that might happen with a credit card? Um, well, in order for somebody to use that card, they have to get the information uh, from the card. Uh, and this may be a case of, <clears throat> somebody purchasing something, either they, the clerk doesn't give them the card back by accident or whatever, so it's laying there, uh, or they misplace the card and somebody else gets the information. Or uh, something else that's come to light uh, as of late is uh, uh, there have been reports of, um, because cell phones now uh, can take photographs, that people are waiting in line with their credit card in their hand, and the credit card is is viewable and somebody, an unscrupulous person can take their camera and take a picture of that credit card. Now they have the credit card number, the name, the expiration date. Now they have a number that they can use. I think a lot of phones wouldn't, wouldn't give you a very good picture, but if somebody really wanted to find a phone that they could use that way, there are phones that, that make better pictures. Sure, and you can enhance the photograph as well from the phone. So. Yeah, the, 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 you know, I haven't seen, I haven't heard any case of this in Albany County, uh, but I try to stay abreast of trends of, in this of area. What could and, happen. Yeah, and we have, you know, we have heard of these things happening. Yeah. Now, there's also the New York State Attorney General. Yes. What, what do they do? Um, they, the Attorney General's office entertains complaints uh, just as we do. Um, typically, though, if it's an individual complaint, uh, you know, let's say somebody is, is uh, is saying they're out a thousand dollars from a contractor or something like that. I don't believe that they they have the time or the resources to uh, to entertain a complaint of that nature. I think they are they are more motivated to uh, entertaining uh, class action type things where you know a company has defrauded many people. Uh, that that is I believe more in their purview okay. than than that. And um, that is something that we would turn over to the Attorney General's okay. office. We had a, a rash of that as well. Sometimes I remember something also, and, and just asking you, it, it came to me. I think they have some uh, registries of uh, tax-exempt organizations. And so if somebody is concerned about a particular organization, or is that the Department of State? No, it may be the Attorney General's office. Yeah, yeah there, is, <clears throat> there, is a, uh, there is a website. Um, I don't know it off the top of my head. I have it at the office. But we could but, look uh, it up if somebody called. Yeah, it, it get, basically gives you a list uh, of uh, frauds that have been reported, types of frauds that, think that have been reported already so that you can, you know, if you have uh, something in, in, in your mind that you're in doubt or, or you know, uh, you're, you're concerned about it, that you can go on there and see if it does uh, fall into that category. People, people as consumers, you know, we talked about buyer beware in the beginning, and uh, another thing that came to me was if, if it sounds too good to be true, it almost assuredly is <laughs> too good to be true. That's true. So, so there's that side of it, but um, wh what kind of laws are there? Uh, there's a lemon law. Mm -hmm. uh, are there laws, regulations? What, what kind of protects people? We, uh, we utilize the general business law. That's, that's primarily uh, going to be the law that uh, is directed towards uh, consumers. Um, uh, the Lemon Law is part of the general business law. Um, you know, it's been in effect for a number of years. Um, and, uh, you know, I can go into that, uh, too, as to what, what qualifies for the Lemon Law, but we'll probably save that for another time. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, the general business law. And, you know, again, that can be accessed uh, on the computer as well. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We're just about out of time. Uh, I think, you know, we can cover a lot of interesting things and, and give tips. Things will occur to people, and you said to me before the show that really the smart thing is think about it before you do it, and if you have a question, you're at the other end of a phone. That's right. Give us a call. So they give could go to your call. website or... Yep. Get your phone. We're user-friendly. They can go on the website and they can file a complaint or ask a question. 
uh, over the website. I try to get back to everyone, usually that the very same day. Uh, the same applies with, uh, with telephone calls. Uh, usually there is somebody there uh, to take the information. And like I said, we make it a point to uh, entertain every complaint. Uh, usually in the case of a, a gasoline uh, complaint, that's, uh, we, we address that usually the very same day, if not the next day, and get back to the consumer of the results of, of what we did. But we will always get back to you uh, on, on what the results were, keep you apprised of, of uh, how we're progressing. And, and I would think that has an, a special value because sometimes we just want to know that things are fair. And, and we're not sure if we were treated fairly or not. And so sometimes the, the contractor may say something and it actually is true. That's right. We just didn't know. And so you're a way to, to find out if, uh, is, is that so. That's right. That's right. Well, I want to thank you for coming back, Tom. Well, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I enjoy this. Super. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thanks, Richard. And I want to thank you for watching and hope you enjoyed the show and that you watch us again in the future. Take care and have a great week. Bye. Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel.